Okay, we are recording. Hello everyone and welcome. Thanks for joining us in the chat box. If you're just joining, there's also a Q&A box. Um, that's where we will be taking questions tonight. So be sure to put your questions in the Q&A. I also have a list of questions that were submitted ahead of time that will be included in the Q&A. Yeah. Okay, at seven o'clock, do you wanna get us started, Michael? Sure, good evening, everyone. I'm Mike Weimer, President and CEO of the Marfan Foundation. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome you to our VEDS uh, research update. You know, we're truly honored to be supporting the VEDS community Individually and collectively, they really are inspiring and you'll meet many of those folks uh, this evening. We also have a volunteer, wonderful volunteer VED steering committee, a great group of physicians and scientists, and we could not be more excited about our results to date in charging forward and saving lives. It's now my pleasure to introduce the director of our VEDS movement, Katie Wright. Katie has done a wonderful job of leading our division. And although I would like to take credit for recruiting Katie, Katie actually recruited me, as some of you may well know, and uh, the rest is uh, sort of history. Uh, she does lead us with uh, great passion and great commitment every day, and I'm sure you'll enjoy uh, having her with you this evening. So with that brief introduction, Katie. Thank you so much, Michael. It has truly been an honor to be in this position for the last year and a half or so and be part of the foundation and, and be doing this beds movement. I mean, the whole community has been incredible, and I'm really excited for everything that we've accomplished and everything that we will in the future together. So welcome to our virtual medical symposium series called Charging Forward. Uh, we are very excited to bring this to you wherever you are. This recording is, this webinar is being recorded and will be available later. So we will be sending out a link to the recording in the next couple of days. And obviously we are the Marfan Foundation's VEZ division. Hopefully you know that if you're here today, but if it's your first time, we are a division of the Marfan Foundation. If you haven't checked out our website, thevezmovement.org, I encourage you to check it out and hopefully the resources there are helpful to you. And I have a really great group of people tonight to introduce. I'm not going to give individual introductions because we have a lot to cover tonight, but I am so grateful to Dr. Tony Asik from the Defy Foundation, Dr. Shane Morris from Baylor College of Medicine, Dr. Hal Dietz from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, and Dr. Peter Byers from the University of Washington. Dr. Shereen Shalhoub from the University of Washington was going to join us tonight, but is unable to attend. So we will carry on and we absolutely love her and appreciate everything that she's done for us. Um, if you have questions during this, any of the presentations, please put them in the Q&A box. We will have time at the end for questions and we will be checking that at the end. If you put them in the chat box, I won't see them, but if you use the Q&A box, that's where it will be. So I will, without further ado, hand it over to Dr. Tony Yasek to kick us off tonight. Thanks, Katie. Uh, on behalf of the Defy Foundation, uh, I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's webinar, uh, hoping to update you on our recent fourth edition uh, Vascular Dental Scientific Meeting. Uh, which we held on uh, April uh, 9th of 2021, not just a couple of weeks ago. It's the third meeting that uh, Defy supported. Our goals are the same as they've been from our original partnership with our, our chairs uh, in Amsterdam in 2018. Uh, their suggestion then was that we develop and support a forum for the scientific community to share current clinical and uh, research data. Uh, to facilitate discussion uh, and collaboration within the VEDS uh, clinical and scientific communities and hopefully encourage and support uh, next generation scientists. Uh, so we're, our, our goals of the meeting were to really achieve that. And I, we had an excellent meeting uh, and I, I think we accomplished all of those and pretty excited to talk about that today. Uh, the details of our meeting, uh, what, uh, just to kind of uh, explain to you how things went. Uh, our meeting was open to researchers, scientists, clinicians, and we had 195 registrants, which was pretty exciting from 18 separate countries, uh, as many as 113 folks online at, at a time. Um, we used a call for abstracts approach to the science to uh, really let the science drive the agenda. And this generated a really uh, wide range of input from the scientific community. There were lots of uh, 
I think younger, intelligent, developing scientists, which is really exciting to see uh, a growing international response. And we generated about seven hours of really robust scientific discussion. Uh, so it was a really great meeting that we're hoping to, uh, for you to hear about today. Uh, there should be attached agenda, Katie, or, or a screen yeah, agenda. Yeah. Thing. yeah. You can share the agenda. Yeah. So uh, just for overall information, five different sessions uh, with uh, five different uh, moderators that uh, the folks that you see today, 22 different presentations. And recording of the meeting is available on uh, the VEDS Movement website. Uh, so you can look through that if you'd like. For me personally, uh, just to give you some updates, and, and uh, I kind of come at it from a clinical, uh, as a clinician, but not a clinician in any of these areas, uh, and really more from with a, a patient and family perspective. So I was very uh, interested and in, in, in intrigued by a number of concepts. There were a lot of studies that were presented, uh, as you might guess, on medications, vitamin C, statins, spironolactone, very interesting studies. Uh, some of the negative effects of Cipro, and then in particular, some newer receptor pathways, the uh, PHC and ERK pathways that we're gonna hear about in a little bit here. Um, very interesting to hear about, even, uh, really from more of a patient and family perspective, in my opinion. Uh, there were structural and functional relationship data uh, presented, lots of uh, information on location of aneurysm, bone density, lung CT findings, cerebral artery tortuosity, lots of different areas that may relate to both diagnosis and prognosis for patients. Um, I found that very intriguing. Uh, and newer data uh, on, uh, and studies on uh, some of the psychological issues that may, may accompany vascular nanos and some beginning data on exercise. All very exciting. Uh, maybe nothing that we made specific recommendations on, but really exciting areas for future study and future recommendations. Um, and finally, uh, just sort of continued information on the, the value of collaborative data. Uh, the VEDS Collaborative now, I think, has 237 patients. Uh, and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Juna Maitre from uh, Paris is also uh, beginning to enroll patients in a, a uh, uh, bowel rupture study. So uh, kind of pooling data, getting collaborative data, getting collaborative information. Um, and that's a value to our community was uh, really uh, on display as well. So uh, I'm really interested in hearing what the scientists and the people who work in this every day, uh, who you're going to hear from in a little bit, have to say about this. So uh, and about our meeting and what you all can learn from that. So I'm going to really, without further ado, turn it over to uh, Dr. Shane Morris, who is a peds cardiologist from the Baylor College of Medicine and a real asset to us in many ways. Hey guys, um, so I'm excited. I'm just going to do a brief overview of some of the science that was presented. You know, we had six and a half hours of science and um, I got about 10 minutes to go over all of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to, oh, here, let me project. Can you guys see that okay? I'm, I just stole some highlights from some of the slides. Is that visible? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Great. So I'm just going to go over some of the um, some of the slides, and I'm going to really focus on the first section, which really talked about novel therapeutic strategies, which I think is really exciting because obviously one of the most frustrating thing is that we don't have great therapies in vascular EDS, and I think some of the work presented was really exciting. So the first session was in, in investigating VEDS therapies and interventions using mouse models. So as some of you remember, Dr. Dietz a couple of years ago had, has really helped elucidate one of the major pathways that seems to be affected in beds in this PKC ERK pathway. And a lot of the current science is sort of focused around modifying this pathway to try to improve outcomes in vascular EDS. And one of the projects presented a couple of years ago showed that a combination of hydralazine, which is a unique blood pressure medicine and spironolactone, which is a medicine that affects um, androgen synthesis, the combination of these might help improve outcomes in mice that one of the mouse models of vascular EDS. And this was really exciting, but really new work and, and a lot of questions came up. So um, I think Dr. Dietz, you know, the new trial that's gonna be discussed later today really focuses on this pathway. And I think he's gonna talk more about it. So I'm gonna just talk about a couple of the specific projects that were discussed at the meeting. So one of them was looking at um, spironolactone as a monotherapy. So spironolactone is a medicine that's a diuretic, but affects 
androgens is used for acne, is used for um, polycystic ovarian syndrome. And so the question was, since it showed effective in combination with hydrology in here, could it be used as monotherapy? And one of the studies looked at male and female mice with beds and said, okay, if we give spironolactone at weaning, so this is an infant, does it prevent outcomes? And just for all of you, there's going to be a lot of um, graphs that look like this. This is called the Kaplan-Meier graph for those of you who aren't familiar with it. But basically, everyone starts off at 100%. This is surviving. And the faster the graph declines, the lines decline, the worse it is. And so you can take a line at 40 days in a mouse and say, okay, this percent are still alive. This percent are still alive. So that's, we're looking for these lines to separate. And what this, and I'll show a lot of these because everyone uses these kind of graphs. So what this showed is that in female mice, there was really no difference between the spironolactone mice and the non-spironolactone treated mice. But in the male mice, there was a little bit of protection when it was started at weaning. So there did seem to be some beneficial effect. What was interesting, and I, I don't totally understand, when we looked at older mice, so this is now we're starting at 60 days and starting spironolactone at an older age, it was protective in both males and females. And so really, really interesting. Um, you know, I can't totally understand why of putting it on later in life. Now, these might be more mildly affected mice because the early ones didn't make it to this age. But really, really interesting that a really commonly used medication, we use this all the time, it's pretty safe, might have some survival benefit. Again, this is a mouse model, but still very exciting. And so the conclusions of this report were that monotherapy initiated prior to puberty improved survival in male mice, although that was modest and then initiated after puberty achieves complete protection in mice of both sexes. So very, very interesting. Shane, could I address your question? Oh, yes. Sure, so if you go back to the prior slide, you know, the way that we interpreted this is that um, something else is needed to protect vascular EDS mice from the time of birth mm -hmm. to, the, to the time of puberty. But if you've already reached puberty, um, if you've already gotten past that vulnerable period, is the use of uh, an androgen blocking drug, a male hormone blocking, blocking drug like spironal, spironolactone sufficient to confer protection from that point forward? That makes sense. So it is a little bit of the survival bias. These are the ones that have survived to this area, to this age, and maybe this can now be helpful once you've gotten this far along. But I don't know if these are necessarily less severely affected mice or just the lucky ones that got through that vulnerable period of infancy. So, um, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. This was a, another study that sort of um, took advantage of the fact that um, if you put a mouse model of VEDS in different kinds of experimental mice, the effect is really different. So this is looking sort of at survival of, the, of um, mice. This is one kind of more severe mouse model. This is a more mild mouse model. But if you put it on this black six background, this kind of mouse, they have way worse outcomes than if you put it on this kind of background. And the question was, do they have some modifier gene in this kind of mice that might affect the outcome in, in these mouse models? And there was a lot of really interesting work and I'm trying to get through this quickly, but basically this gene MAP2K6 came out as looking like a pretty important modifier and does affect this pathway. And the thought is that if you have a higher level of this protein, it increases this P38, which ultimately inhibits this pathway. And so they tried and they gave a P38 inhibitor to sort of block this protective pathway and saw that there was worse outcomes. And what's neat is this might be another therapeutic target or be a therapeutic target for treatment. And again, I think there'll be more detail about this, but it's just another really exciting um, area to look at modifiers of the pathway that's being affected. Another um, study that came up is looking at Soliprolol and pravastatin, statins that are like an anti-statin and anti-lipid drug in vascular EDS. And I'm just gonna get to the punchline. They basically looked at aortic rupture force measurement. So this isn't looking at dissection or rupture in mouse models, but sort of this unique measure of relative force. And we're comparing it, the green bars, these are in different segments of the aorta. The green bar is the mouse without VEDS. The red is the VEDS mouse. And then these are all different. This is soliprolol, losartan, basoprolol, which is another beta blocker, and a statin. 
and saying, how much does it recover their aortic force and the higher force, the better. And again, this is a mouse model and this is a proxy measure. But what was interesting is that the pravastatin and the soliparol in this assay got you the closest to the wild type. So again, pretty early experimental data, but, but quite interesting. Going through, um, this is a study, I know there's been so many questions about vitamin C. So this was an exciting one to see. Looking at high dose vitamin C again in a mouse model, seeing if it helped survival at all. And what they showed is that in a female mouse, there did seem to be benefit, but in male mice, not so much. Um, and depending now, they some experiments when it was started, when it was stopped, there did seem to be a window. But as far as I know, this is the first study of vitamin C um, and, and outcomes. Now we're gonna skip around, skip. This was another one looking at exercise uh, that I thought was very interesting. They looked at two kinds of exercise, aerobic exercise. So this is cardio or dynamic exercise. And then they looked at isometric or static exercise to see if it affected outcome. Again, this is all mouse models, but this is overall, and this is dividing males and females. And again, this blue line is the mice that don't have VEDs. The red line is the mice that do have VEDs. And the green line is the um, mice with VEDs that had got trapped on a treadmill, basically. And so we, there was no big effect seen for the dynamic or aerobic exercise in males or females. But was really interesting, there's this model of isometric, you know, you can't make a mouse lift weights. Um, and so there's this model of isometric exercise where you put a mouse, I guess, clung to the cage and it increases their, it's a, a model of isometric exercise. So I just think this is amazing. And they looked at the same thing and said, well, is it, this is obviously a proxy for kinds of isometric exercise we do. Um, and said, well, do we see a benefit here? And when they looked at the group as a whole, there was no big change, right? This green line is kind of similar to the red line. But if you looked at males and females, the females that did this kind of exercise were completely protected in this experiment versus the males were worse. So this is really, really interesting. This is called sexual dimorphism when, it, when a treatment or effect modification, if you're doing epidemiology, but it's, it's the treatment has a different effect in males than females. And again, something that really needs to be explored and is, is quite interesting and hasn't been explored as far as I know to date. Really interesting, Shane, because it's, it's unex, unexpected and really not logically explained initially right, right, for, right. without looking at it, right? So interesting. That's why we do the studies, I guess, on lots of stuff. That's right. So. Should we have females lifting weights? You know, I mean, we probably need a right. little more work, but super, super interesting. Yep. Skipping ahead, most of the rest of the meeting was looking at phenotyping. Phenotyping is just how someone looks or acts or how, how their imaging studies show and clinical outcomes and how these might correlate also with genotype. So these are just some highlights. I'm not going to go over the rest of the studies as much as detail, but there were two studies from two large pediatric groups looking at who has events in pediatric and mostly these were teenagers and characterizing them. I encourage you to go look at the presentations couple of studies on imaging biomarkers, looking at vertebral artery tortuosity as an imaging biomarker of who's more severe and less severe, looking at bone density. Also, it's showing that people with um, certain variants are more likely to have low bone density than others. Lots of stuff looking at, um, again, phenotyping, looking at cervical artery lesions, looking at aortic involvement, looking at lung lesions and gestational age. And again, I don't have time to go through all of this, but I think it's really nice to show the variance of how patients are affected when we're looking at all these other organs and other parts of the body that we don't really classically think about as much and, and also looking at gestational age here. There was a very interesting study looking at the extracellular matrix variability, looking in kinds of variance in vascular EDS, and this was their summary slide. Basically, they did all these different assays of the wall, the vessel wall in vascular EDS, and looking at three models, two were haploinsufficient models, so kind of null variants, and then a glycine substitution, and how it affected the wall. And it was really interesting because the haploinsufficient model actually had a thinner wall, but the stress ratio was different. Sorry, the haploinsufficient had thinner walls, but the stress ratio was more different in glycine substitution. So again, trying to figure out why events occur earlier in those with glycine substitutions and splicite variants compared to null variants, like what's the actual mechanism. 
And just last, lastly, a couple of other very interesting studies. This was um, really looking at psychosocial aspects of vascular EDS through Annabelle's Challenge in the UK and doing some really detailed qualitative surveys, looking at um, what major themes were. And they identified six themes that were really identified as important. They're listed here on the right. I think any patient or family member or caregiver can recognize these as, as super important, but actually putting this into research and, and putting these as priorities for addressing how we how we help these and support patients um, in these arenas is really important. And lastly, and I think Dr. Byers is going to talk about this, Dr. Shalhoub uh, discussed how the progress in the VEDS collaborative study. And I didn't put any of her slides up because I think that Dr. Byers is going to discuss that. So thank you guys for giving me a minute to go over it. I really, really encourage you to look at the recording. The presentations were really clear and really excellent. Um, and it was really fun to watch. Thank you so much, Dr. Morris. And I think now we will hand it over to Dr. Dietz to talk about the upcoming clinical trial announcement that occurred a couple of weeks ago. So uh, Dr. Dietz, I will hand it over to you and let you introduce Nate and Topher as well at when the opportunity arises. Sure. <clears throat> so um, I'd like to take this opportunity to also share the excitement and enthusiasm that um, Tony and uh, Shane have uh, expressed regarding the recent meeting. It was a real triumph for the Defy Foundation and I think a landmark event um, in the research of vascular EDS. Um, so I have the privilege now of um, talking about a new initiative, uh, perhaps a new era in um, vascular EDS research. Um, and that is the realization that um, there is uh, intent, there is commitment, um, there is a path forward um, to launch a large, prospective, well-controlled, um, clinical trial in vascular EDS that has the potential um, to be a, a pivotal moment in our understanding of the care of people um, with this condition. So um, I, I want to start with the, found, the scientific foundations that underlie um, this trial. Uh, you know, I, um, I would say perhaps five or six years ago, um, many of us in the field um, shared our thinking on this and um, realized that in vascular EDS, we couldn't simply rely on lessons learned um, from other vascular connective tissue disorders. While, while there were some similarities, um, there were important differences. Um, for example, Marfan syndrome and Loewy's Dietz syndrome and Sprintz and Goldberg syndrome, they all look alike in many ways. And our current understanding is that they share uh, common features of mechanism, um, but there were many differences in vascular EDS. Instead of aortic aneurysms um, predominantly occurring at the base of the aorta, a place that we call the aortic root, um, in vascular EDS, we saw that the aortic root is typically spared. It, it's not involved. Um, and that there could be aneurysms of any large artery um, throughout the arterial tree. Um, we also um, have the common belief understanding that tear of blood vessels in vascular EDS commonly happens uh, without prior enlargement of the blood vessels, certainly something that needs to be studied further. Um, that there's a high risk of um, operative complications in vascular EDS, unlike um, many of these other conditions, and that there were other associated risks like um, the possibility of tear of hollow organs, including the bowel and uterus. So, you know, I, I think the takeaway message at the time was that we have to do dedicated studies of this condition. We can't assume that the lessons learned from other conditions will apply to vascular EDS. Um, so, you know, at, at that time, <clears throat> and with the support of numerous um, patient advocacy foundations, uh, we committed to making bona fide animal models of vascular EDS. We, we, we didn't want to approximate the mechanism of vascular EDS in these mice. We wanted to duplicate 
the mechanism that was known in people. And um, after discussions with um, a number of leaders in the field, including uh, Peter, um, we decided to make um, a couple of different mutations in the COL3A1 gene, um, both involving the substitution of uh, a building block of proteins called glycine that's particularly important in determining the structure and function of type 3 collagen. Um, and you know, these so-called glycine substitutions are the most common class of mutations um, causing vascular EDS in people. So we made two different glycine substitutions, one predicted to be more mild, the other predicted to be some more severe. Um, both of these predictions turned out to be true um, with the more mild animal model showing about 50% um, death to, due to a vascular event by about 400 days of age and the more severe models uh, showing 50% um, death due to aortic rupture by about only 50 days of age. Um, we decided not to make any assumptions. We, we decided to use what we call unbiased methods um, to let the biology teach us, to not simply test our biased hypotheses, but to say, show us what's true. Um, so one of those methods involved um, simply taking a segment of the aorta of these mice that we knew was vulnerable, was prone to tear. And um, we asked, what are the differences in the patterns of genes that are turned on and turned off in the mice with vascular EDS? And we saw that there were definite patterns, re reproducible patterns that we saw in the mice with vascular EDS um, compared to what we call wild type mice, which mean mice that don't have vascular EDS. And once we saw these reproducible patterns, again, in an unbiased way with, without imposing any of our hypotheses, we asked the computer to tell us what's most likely to cause these gene expression changes. And unequivocally, the computer told us that this likely involves an abnormality of um, information passing from outside of the cells of the blood vessels to inside the cells of the blood vessels. And more specifically, this more most likely related to a perturbation of a cellular signaling pathway that we call the PKC ERK axis. The, the precise deta details of this are less important than the understanding that this was an unequivocal message um, that the computer algorithms were telling us. Uh, this is where we should pay attention. So, you know, we didn't know if this was a quirk of our mice, uh, a quirk of this experimental system, or truly something fundamental about the disease process. So what we reasoned is that if the what the computer was telling us was true, then if we blocked this pathway, um, using either a drug that blocks this PKC point in the pathway or another drug that blocks this ERK activation point in the pathway, then we should make the mice better. They should live longer. You know, that's a testable hypothesis. If the answer is no, we are wrong. We need to look somewhere else. If the answer is yes, there's something real here. So we gave these uh, vascular EDS mice a drug called rebuxastorin that blocks PKC and a drug called cobimetinib that blocks ERK activation and asked the question, does it make these mice with vascular EDS better? And the unequivocal answer was yes. So these are the types of curves um, that Dr. Morris showed you previously, they're called survival curves. 
Uh, again, everybody at birth starts at 100% survival. And then you look at the rate of decline in survival or the rate of death due to vascular events in these mice. As you can see, as shown in orange, the vascular EDS mice show a predictable pattern of death due to vascular events, again, with about only 50% survival by uh, 40 to 50 days of age in our more severe model. If you treat those mice with a PKC inhibitor with Robuxastorin, instead of 50% death at 50 days, we saw 90% survival. Um, the same type of pattern was seen when we used a drug that prevent, prevented ERK inactivation. Again, instead of uh, frequent death, 50% death by 50 days, again, we saw about 90% survival. Um, so the answer uh, about whether um, Blocking these pathways makes a difference um, with the caveat that these are mice, uh, as everyone will point out, uh, was unequivocally uh, yes, th that um, th this does confer a survival benefit. So we ask, you know, can we get the same answer if we look at this in a completely different way? You know, let's take another unbiased approach that's not influenced by our perceptions or hopes um, going into the study. And again, as um, Dr. Morris mentioned, um, we found that one strain of mouse um, uh, that we call um, the 129 mouse was dramatically protected despite having a vascular EDS mutation. This was true as shown in green, if the mice had our mild mutation, but it was equally true and even more startling um, in the presence of our really severe vascular EDS mutation. Uh, here now at, in the uh, mice on the vulnerable mouse background, 50% are dead by 50, uh, age, um, 50 days of age. 100% have died from a vascular event by 150 days of age. But if you put the same severe vascular EDS mutation on this protected uh, 129 ba mouse background, they live and live and live and live a full mouse lifespan of uh, two years uh, without ever showing uh, a consequence of having this mutation. So this was nature telling us that I have a strategy to beat this disease. Um, and our clear incentive at that, that point was to understand nature's strategy. Perhaps a drug could be used to mimic um, this strategy to beat vascular EDS. So we used a variety of um, genetic methods, standard genetic methods, um, to try to understand how nature had uh, achieved this remarkable success. And we learned that the protected mice had an important difference in a specific gene that's called MAP2K6. And again, the name of the gene is not so important. Even the precise function of the gene is not important, but the mechanism by which this variation in this gene was protective was important and informative. What we could uh, ultimately show is that the protected mice had a copy of the MAP2K6 gene that showed high activity, that this activated a, a sequence of, uh, of factors and enzymes in the body that culminated in blocking our old culprits PKC and ERK. So completely different strategy. Nature, tell us what you got. And once again, we collapsed on the same PKC and ERK pathway. And we could show that the protected 129 mice 
protected for the, their full lifetime showed no increase in activation of PKC um, or ERK, validating the strategy to block um, these enzymes. Uh, and that is uh, again shown um, in, in this somewhat complicated blot. So, you know, we were really respectful of the fact that these are mice, that we need to try to make this relevant to people. So we've begun the process of looking at samples from people with vascular EDS and specifically vascular samples um, from people um, that have this condition. And we asked the very direct question, is there a signal for high uh, levels of PKC and ERK activation as shown by this green signal? So here you see someone without vascular EDS, you can see there's not much green going on. If we go to the descending aorta of someone with vascular EDS, or, uh, and, or we look at the iliac artery of someone with vascular EDS, you see high levels of this green signal, meaning there is high PKC activation. Same story if we look at activation of ERK um, as the green signal, very little, if any, in the healthy sample, um, but really clear high levels of activation in the patient samples. So um, to summarize literally dozens of experiments looking at multiple sources of vulnerability in people and recapitulated in mice with vascular EDS, everything is boiling down to activation of PKC and ERK. Um, this includes the predisposition imposed by pregnancy which signals through this pathway. This includes the predisposition associated with um, sexual maturity and particularly sexual maturity in young men with vascular EDS. Again, we could show that this is directly collapsing on this PKC and ERK pathway. So um, now, I would say almost three years ago, um, I had the surprise and good fortune of being contacted by two folks that I didn't know at all. Um, their, name was, uh, their names um, are Nate Masari and Topher Brook. Um, and they explained um, that they had very successful careers in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and at, at this stage in their career, they wanted to dedicate themselves to the creation of a new entity that was focused on rare and underserved pediatric disease populations, um, and that they had developed already um, a specific interest, a specific commitment um, to patients with vascular EDS. And I, I won't go through the, the personal de details about how they got there, um, but they were there when they already contacted me. Um, you know, what I can say is that they have dedicated themselves tirelessly to this commitment of translating the basic science um, to uh, a, a clinical trial. You know, not to uh, directly to uh, marketing a drug and making big profits. That was never the equation. The equation was we got to do this right. We need to find a strategy to finance a big, well controlled, definitive clinical trial um, of these strategies for vascular EDS. And I can tell you it was hard. Um, it was very hard and they should be celebrated um, for their commitment. Um, what I can tell you is that there was a lot of excitement in the field broadly about the potential of PKC inhibition. Um, that was uh, partly because of the mouse data that we had generated, 
but it was also because um, this wasn't something brand new, that there was experience in the pharmaceutical industry in developing drugs to block PKC. And in fact, there was extensive experience in the pharmaceutical industry making sure that PKC inhibitors are effective in people and making sure that PKC inhibitors are safe in people. So a lot of the work to so-called de-risk the project had already been done uh, in pursuit of treatments um, for other conditions. Um, but you know, to get a, a partner to invest the many, many, many millions of dollars to run a definitive trial um, remained a big challenge. Um, and um, because of their talents and commitment, um, you know, on April 12th of this year, uh, we had the exciting news um, that a, a pharmaceutical company called I2 Biopharma had decided to partner uh, with uh, these folks to take this risk um, and to uh, uh, launch a, uh, a large definitive clinical trial um, of PKC inhibitors, uh, specifically a drug called Enzostorin. Um, in people with vascular EDS. So that's the commitment we have. It will be large. It will be large enough to reach conclusions. It will be well controlled. It will be multinational and it will provide an answer. We don't know that that answer will be yes. We hope it will, um, but it will give us an answer. Um, we um, at, uh, at Rumpus and ultimately at I2 um, have had early dialogue with the Food and Drug Administration regarding designation of Enzostorin as an investigational new drug um, for vascular EDS. Um, you know, but uh, what I want to emphasize is that um, the successful design and launch of this trial will depend on multiple invested um, constituencies, um, including um, academic clinicians and scientists with expertise in vascular EDS, including the FDA, including independent review and safety monitoring boards, including patient advocacy groups that will prominently include um, the great activities of the Marfan Foundation and Defy and other uh, 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 specific groups for beds, um, and including individuals with vascular EDS. So um, nothing has been predetermined. Uh, we're at the point where um, we are um, committed to engage everyone to make this um, uh, successful. So uh, I'm going to end there. Um, I, uh, I'm thrilled um, to announce that um, both Nate and Topher are, are joining us on this call and uh, will be um, engaged in the question and answer session um, to um, you know, address any questions or concerns that people have. And um, I will turn it back um, to Katie. Thank you so much, Dr. Dietz, and thank you, Nate and Topher, for joining us tonight. I've seen a lot of questions come in in the Q&A. Very excited to get to those. And we have one more presentation before we get to the Q&A. If you have submitted your question via the chat box, please copy and paste it into the Q&A box. And I do have uh, a lot of questions printed out already that people have submitted in advance. So we will get to as many as we possibly can tonight. But please, if you've put it in the chat box, please use the Q&A box instead. Thank you so much. And I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Peter Byers, who's going to present an update on the VEDS Collaborative. Thank you, Peter. And I think you're on mute. <laughs> I think you're still on mute. We're working on that. Hold on, everybody. We will, we will get Peter unmuted in a moment. <laughs> All right. There you go. Unmuted. Okay. And we can see your your screen um, in just uh, presentation mode. You can or can't. Great. You're good to go. Thank you. 
Okay, that's Hal's screen. Nope, I am off. Oh, <laughs> you're not good to go yet. But he's not muted. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, your wish is my command. Very astute oh. observation. <laughs> uh, so do you... Do you no. see the slide? The bed's I, I do not see your slides. Yeah. Not yet. Not yet. Now? Oh, I. Sorry. Hold on just a minute. Let me go back here. You see the green thing at the bottom? Yeah, I, I've got to get back to that first. That's the problem. Okay, up here and then there. Oh, that green thing. There we go. <laughs> like little green men. Perfect. That now okay? Yes, you're good to go. Okay. So this is just I it um it's always very difficult to follow a presentation by how. <laughs> And all I can say is that there is a certain integration between these two. But the, um, the vascular EDS collaborative uh, study is something that was started by Shireen uh, here at the University of Washington to uh, follow on from a uh, PCORI application that was looking at trying to create um, some of the characteristics that we're now finding in the VEDS community, that is having a much greater patient involvement and family involvement. Uh, and um, identifying the, the things that were important and trying to sort out. Um, and this is something that Shreen presented at the meeting. And you can see that there are a number of people that have been involved in this and in, in getting it going. Um, one of the things that was of great concern to Shireen and when we uh, were talking about uh, what we knew about people is that uh, we tended to have the written record, but we didn't have the visual record. And so the, the imaging that uh, Hal talked about, about where things are happening and all those kinds of things was generally uh, not very well described. And uh, so imaging became one of the things that was important. Uh, this was recognized in the Gentech consortium where images are being brought together. And it was, this was one way to focus on the vascular EDS people to bring together medical records and imaging um, as well as the um, uh, genetic uh, characteristics. So genotype phenotype correlation was very important. And then there were people from the literature who could be entered in because we could identify the stories and uh, put them together. So this was, this was a way to create a very uh, comprehensive knowledge of natural history. Um, we had talked with uh, uh, the group from Rumpus about how to use this and whether or not it could be predictive in certain kinds of ways. It was frustrating in part because the data that we had available wasn't as complete as was necessary. And this was a way to change that. So uh, as uh, Shireen said here that the aim of this uh, project was to provide no review of the currently enrolled cohort and, and for this presentation. Uh, there is some uh, Peculiar things sticking there, I don't know why, but there are 232 people enrolled, 192 that have pathogenic or likely pathogenic uh, variants. And uh, as happens with many of these things, which are self-initiated, um, about almost two thirds of them were women or females as opposed to uh, a smaller number of males. But the medical uh, records have been uh, taken out. This is the age distribution that you can see. So. In contrast to some of the other kinds of uh, programs uh, that did not have children or uh, under 18, this uh, reflected the kinds of things that Shane uh, and a couple of the British groups are doing and trying to collect them. And of the, the ones that we had identified in the study that we uh, did, that Melanie Pepin was uh, instrumental in putting together, it had over 1,200 people in it. Um, more than 10% of those were actually children. More than, and <clears throat> obviously, if you have all the people that are of a given age that are above 20, you also have a pediatric history involved. And uh, we should not forget that because that's a very important uh, aspect of trying to put it together. Peter, I'm going to interrupt you for just a moment. Um, yeah. There's a lot of 
feedback coming from your microphone, I think. And I think some of it's just a background hum, but if you could try to um, speak closer to your microphone. Uh, <clears throat> it, it's, um, I'll do what I can. Is that, is that better if I sit I up, that's sit up yeah, close? Kind of, okay, I'm very sorry. Uh, shuffling maybe. Um, It'll be good. So, and uh, as Hal said, uh, these kinds of studies need to involve people basically everywhere. You can see here, University of Washington, uh, Weill Cornell, Hopkins Children's, Texas, uh, uh, Texas Children's Hospital, Mount Sinai, Oregon Health and Sciences, Seattle Children's Hospital, and a number of other places that have been very important in identifying people and, and bringing them into the community, including the University of Texas at Houston with Diana Millowitz and wash you with uh, uh, St. Louis with Alan Gregory. So uh, this is a, a project to engage families um, <clears throat> and to bring together people and make these data available for all the natural history studies. So interested in um, what happens at the general physiologic level to people and recognizing, as Tony pointed out at the beginning, that vascular EDS uh, is not just a vascular condition. It, it is really a systemic uh, condition that um, involves um, every, basically every organ in the, in the body. And we tend, and I worried a lot when it was renamed vascular EDS, that we would ignore that. Um, I think that we as investigators have not. It doesn't seem to have limited the uh, referral of people into the studies. Um, but uh, it's a very important thing to recognize. And I think uh, it would be, you know, it's always going to be worthwhile to ask whether any of the interventions um, are helpful in, in um, changing uh, the nature or the progression of, of the non-vascular uh, 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 conditions. So this is, this is uh, a way that we put together here at the University of Washington to bring people in to uh, uh, bring in complete records, including medical history, so that we know some idea about what's been happening up to this point, and to provide a, uh, basically a background uh, on which um, the kinds of studies that Hal um, has been talking about in, in terms of, you know, what do you need to know ahead of time? What are the controls? What, what kind of information do you have from the past that's helpful in, in guiding expectations. So that's, that's what Shireen has and what she talked about at, at, um, at that point. I think one of the things to remember when we talk about uh, the natural history of this condition is that we are talking about a selected group of people um, in whom often the entry into the, um, into the group that's going to be studied is has occurred because they've had events occur. And so we have a whole lot of people that are left out. And um, in the kind of genetic variation that Hal was talking about, we have to wonder how many people are protected. And what do we do when we change the nature of the group that we're studying um, uh, to look at, which I think is, you know, is going to be one of the fascinating aspects of, of this. And I have to uh, thank Tony for uh, expanding our vocabulary. We will always refer to um, NGS as next generation sequencing, but Tony expanded that and told us about the next generation scientists using next generation sequencing to understand the next generation of, of uh, symptoms and uh, findings in people with vascular EDS. Love the next gen. Yeah, no, love the next gen, right? <laughs> The next gens, actually. Yes, you know, yes, love uh, the next gens. Welcome aboard. Uh, yeah, exactly. So um, I think that's uh, that's a summary of what uh, Shireen was uh, has been involved in and doing here in the Seattle. And it's been, I think, as everybody on <clears throat> in the group here has recognized that being involved with uh, this group has been an astonishing adventure and um, one that has been very satisfying. I think that we have moved, I think that um, many people on the call uh, will recognize the, uh, the, the, uh, the cry of, but my doctor doesn't know anything about vascular EDS. 
And I think that one of the things is, in fact, they do. They just don't recognize it by that name because they've dealt with many of the complications that people have had all along. And we're hoping that uh, with this kind of <clears throat> integration, and I think also the drive to uh, therapeutic approaches, that suddenly the interest will expand. And I think that we will recognize that there are far more people than we think who are involved with this. Uh, so it will be a much more general um, condition than we recognize. So that's, um, I, uh, I, I think that everybody has really summarized uh, really very beautifully the, the kinds of things that happened uh, and the kinds of interactions and the kinds of advances that were made. Uh, when this was started, um, I've always referred to this as the almost annual vascular EDS uh, meeting. And we've had a little bit trouble. We've had more trouble with uh, more, more success with the almost than with the annual. Um, but um, the difference between the first meeting, which was in Chicago in 2015, and this meeting is dramatic. And each meeting in that group of four now has been equally dramatic in, in sort of making advances and um, getting people truly interested in what's happening. And I, I can't be, um, I can't even be more satisfied than Hal in, in terms of, you know, what, what the advances have been. It's really it is striking and I'm very encouraged by what is happening and, and what we can expect. And also by the involvement of many very talented people across the world in, in looking at these kinds of things uh, and, and, and people with this condition and in trying to get all the studies right. So, and that range has been, as uh, Shane pointed out, from psychosocial to exercise um, through all of the drug, uh, drug development and, and drug treatment. And I think that uh, we can sort of see that opening um, to uh, uh, do all kinds of very beneficial things for people with vascular EDS. So that's the end. Thank you so much, Dr. Byers, and thank you all for your presentation tonight. Uh, we have, if it's okay with everybody, if we could go an extra maybe 20 minutes to get as many questions as possible. Um, so we're gonna jump right into the Q&A. Uh, Peter, if you'd like to stop sharing your screen, I will start asking. I just learned how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will go ahead while you, perfect. Okay, so um, we had a lot of questions come in and thank you everybody so much for all of your questions. Some of them are repeats, so I think I'm gonna cover some of the major themes here and then any questions that are not covered during this, um, we, there is a way to get your questions answered at the end. So, or after. So I'm going to start, obviously there's a lot of excitement around the trial. So I think I will, I will start there. Um, and this question is going to be for Hal, Nate and Topher. There's a lot of questions about whether the trial will be global, if people in Australia or Italy will be able to participate, whether it will include children, or if you'll have to get off your medications to participate. What do we know right now about the answers to these questions? I think I think any patient from across the patient spectrum, how do I get involved, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Did you, or, uh, Hal, do you want me to handle that question? Sure, go ahead. Great. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Topher Brook, and uh, Nate and I are, uh, well, would state up front, completely humbled um, by the opportunity to participate with this community. We, um, we've dedicated ourselves to what we refer to as neglected pediatric diseases. So those are diseases that obviously impact kids and adults, but also um, have no uh, approve more um, uh, therapies. And our, our hope is that we can run this definitive trial. Um, to answer your question, this will be a global trial. This will be, um, you, know, uh, you know, US, Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, other countries that we're hoping to scoop into this. Um, and our, our hope is that we can run um, the definitive trial uh, for vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. You know, this is a uh, you know, our commitment to this community um, of heroes who have um, worked in this uh, disease area, like Dr. Byers, uh, to people like uh, Tony, who have an incredible um, 
you know, foundation, of course, Katie and the vets movement. I mean, what an incredible um, you know, commitment to this disease. And of course, and, and how, right? I mean, um, I would tell you that uh, when Nate and I first met Hal about three years ago, the linear methodical nature of his research absolutely blew us away. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll run a global trial for sure. Thank you. Any, any idea yet whether kids will be able to be involved or if you'll have to get off your blood pressure medication in order to participate? Yeah, thanks, Katie. So we're still working with the FDA. We went to the FDA this past May for a pre-IND meeting and um, talked to them a little bit about our clinical trial design and plans and um, had a great discussion around uh, kids, uh, more particular kids in their second generation of life. Um, and uh, that's an ongoing conversation with the FDA. Our hope is that in the next six months that we'll file an IND, which will is basically the starting gun for a clinical trial. Um, our view of the world is that um, people should be able to stay on any type of background medications that they're currently on, um, any type of standard of care, anything that your doctor has prescribed, that that is uh, something you should be able to stay on uh, as, as part of this clinical program. It feels like the right thing to do. Sounds like you guys are doing this, but really just putting it in word to advocate to have kids included, you know, as we're recognizing disparities more across all spectrums. I mean, kids have been discriminated against in research trials and that's why we're flying so blindly. So whatever you guys can do to include children, um, please do it. Shane, we could not agree more. That's actually the reason that we started the company three years ago. Um, the name, uh, for those who aren't familiar, Rumpus is a nod to the Maury Sendak children's book, Where the Wild Things Are. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, connotes our commitment to, to kids. Um, we originally approached the FDA with a, a parallel um, pharmacokinetic study with kids. And um, one of the medical, the chief, the, the, the head uh, clinical reviewer at the FDA um, said, well, I'd rather have them included, even if it's a small cohort, because I don't want those patients to have to wait. We totally agree. We just have to make sure that we've got this trial um, set up in a way that we have statistical powering. Um, but that's our intention. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, we have to balance safety issues in someone who's growing and developing. Um, but our absolute intention is to um, create a therapy that will be relevant um, to children and tested in children in short order. Um, awesome, and even like the vaccines, how they started in 16 year olds post puberty and then rapidly went to the younger kids, even if it's some stepwise design like that. Yep, so. agreed. Great, okay, so the next question that I have for you, and maybe this might be a question for Hal, um, when, we're looking at the Intestorin trial. Is there any idea if the bowel perforations or anything like that will be included as outcomes or is this specifically focusing on vascular events? Yeah, um, so we will certainly include um, the broad spectrum of secondary outcomes, but um, the primary outcome for this trial, the data that we can uh, you know, have uh, direct support for from our preclinical mouse models is uh, focused on vascular disease. Um, we will certainly be um, collecting um, information, uh, broad information on um, people enrolled in the trial. And we also tend to, uh, or uh, intend um, to synergize with parallel efforts, including the uh, BEDS Collaborative Natural History Study. I, I don't think, uh, you know, our, in our belief, um, we should take every opportunity to facilitate all complementary research efforts in this population. So um, we will um, certainly be collecting information regarding skin and bowel and pregnancy related um, complications in vascular EDS. Thank you. And I think the last question before I move on um, for the trial at this time, if we have extras at the end, and there's so many questions. Um, is there a timeline for the trial? Do we know how long the trial would last and, and how far after the trial ends would we have answers? Um, so I can give my two cents. I think um, Topher and Nate um, will likely want to weigh in on this. Um, you know, time, um, 
you know, time uh, line for the trial. Um, you know, we have a lot of work to do to uh, plan this and execute this in an efficient and responsible manner. Um, we have high incentive uh, for that to happen um, as quickly as possible. Um, but I, I don't think any of us could say that within six months or nine months, um, the trial will be enrolling. Um, but, um, you know, certainly, uh, again, high incentive to make that um, as efficient as possible. Um, we have, you know, the, there, we have done some modeling regarding what uh, number of patients uh, we would likely need to enroll to make this uh, an informative, definitive trial. Um, we have some um, early estimates regarding the duration of the trial um, that you know is anticipated to be on the order of uh, a couple of years. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's preliminary to, to commit um, to that. Again, we're going to be engaging um, many of our f colleagues on this call and um, many other people um, to help us um, plan, uh, again, something that is responsible and definitive um, for this population. So uh, I wouldn't want to speculate excessively. Uh, I don't know if... Um, Topher or Nate, you want to add to that? Yeah, Hal, it's Nate and um, Katie et al. Thanks for including us tonight and thrilled to, uh, to play a small part in trying to help this community. Um, the one thing I was going to add to what Hal said, and this is really where the collaboration comes in, um, the one thing that we can all control um, is uh, how quickly this trial enrolls. Um, and that starts with spreading the word, obviously getting to the right centers, of course, doing it appropriately in terms of screening and consenting. But you know, to Hal's point, we're going to have to have a fixed duration to show statistical significance. So once it's enrolled, you're sort of locked in in terms of the year and a half or so for observation. But where we can really sort of make advancements and progress is on the enrollment piece. And obviously, Katie and Joe and, and Michael it will be a big part of that. So just wanted to put that out there. And, and Hal would just supplement your comment to say, you know, the faster that we enroll, the faster we can get to observation. And then from there, um, it's, it's anywhere from sort of six to 12 months to, uh, you know, uh, file and hear back from, from the FDA for uh, marketing authorization should the, the data prove to be beneficial. Hal, you mentioned numbers enrolled, or, is, although that's preliminary. Is, is that something you're able to comment on? Yeah, uh, the estimate is that it would be um, somewhere in, in slight excess, excess of 200 um, individuals, um, you know, give or take a bit, um, but somewhere in that neighborhood. Great, thank you so much. Um, and we're gonna move on to some more questions. I think a couple of you are actually answering questions typing in the Q&A box. So I really appreciate that because we do have so many and so much excitement around this. Um, I'm going to move on to a question about the defy VADS scientific meeting, and that was if any new mutations of VADS are being studied, um, and maybe, Peter, this also includes the natural history study or the work that you're doing at UW, but some people have uh, VUSs or don't know the significance of their mutation, and they're curious if there's any new research going on in that area. So I will let uh, Peter or, or Tony or anybody who wants to jump in and answer that question. Oh. <clears throat> um, mutation identification is, is basically an ongoing process and it, it uh, involves, uh, now I think it's primarily handled by the commercial companies like in Vitae, GeneDX. We still do um, you know, a couple of dozen a year, but we used to do you know, many more than that. Um, I think one of the problems with um, the other places is that they um, uh, they use algorithms to uh, come to conclusions about things, and, and they're not as complete as uh, the uh, you know the involved experience that uh, uh, other programs have. So there certainly is a you know we answer questions all the time from people asking about what kind of mutation they have, what it does. Uh, we have a program for looking at the effects, whether there are splice splice effects of synonymous or uh, that is um, non-amino acid substitutions, but nucleotide substitutions that don't change an amino acid, whether they affect splicing. We have ways of looking at the outcome of splice site mutations and, 
and asking what the effects are. We do that because um, you can have different effects uh, that you can't always predict from the sequence alone. So there's a fair amount of work going on in those areas. Um, I'm, I think that there's some of, some of this is happening in Europe as well. Um, in, and particularly in, I think in uh, England, in the uh, diagnostic groups in England, I think it's also happening. I know it's also happening with the Belgian group and I think that some of the other ones are doing it as well. So certainly there's uh, involvement in doing that. And it's one of the efforts is to try to, um, what, we, what we were hoping to do is to eliminate the whole category of VUS, that is a variance of unknown significance. Uh, because I think with enough or, uh, and sometimes without very much, sometimes it's a matter of looking at it and I mean, just eyeballing it and saying, no, this is, this is not going to be a causative event or saying, well, yes, this is. And it's reported that way because it hasn't been reported before, which is one of the rules for how to report. So I think that there's a lot going on and it's uh, always nice to be able to help people with that. Thank you. And I think a follow up question to that, uh, maybe for uh, Nate or Topher and uh, Peter, for people who have a VUS or even um, have a mosaic mutation, this is something that's coming up. What are they able to participate in? Are they able to participate in the natural history study? Do we know if they'll be able to participate in the Ancestorin trial? Um, why don't we do Peter for the for the collaborative question first, and then Nader Topher for the for the Antistorm trial. So for people have who have VUS, uh, we have been taking them um, uh, with the intent uh, of reclassifying them if we can. Um, uh, up to this point, uh, we have not identified anybody who's mosaic who's symptomatic, which is interesting. And it's um, people who are mosaic for these mutations have cells located in particular areas. So you could imagine that they would have a very localized arterial event or a bowel event as a consequence of that, but they are not very likely to be studied if this is all they have and they don't have any systematic or uh, systemic findings. It's localized, these are localized because there's a group of cells that is making something and the matrix that they make is deposited right around the cells. It doesn't go out and sort of go out and uh, get uh, everything else uh, around it. And that's why it's not, um, it, it is often would be rec not recognized. We identified people because uh, there have been families in which there are two affected children who don't have affected parents. And we, in those circumstances, we find that one of the parents is always mosaic. Sometimes the mosaicism is limited to the germ cells alone and not to uh, systemic cells. So uh, my guess is that while they would be, um, I, I think that they would not really be a target for the trial because they're not expected to have events. Um, and in fact, the fact that they're not affected for, to have events is a reason not to be involved in the trial. Um, that's fair. So that's for, um, so for Mosaic, maybe not involved in the trial, right. uh, but for VUS is definitely in the natural history study. Uh, Nate or Topher, do you want to answer for the Ancestorin? If you want me to weigh on this, uh, weigh in on this guys, I'm happy to as well. Um, so uh, um, the pursuit of a trial is to take a group of people who are at risk to do one thing in one group and to do something else in another group and ask if your intervention made a difference. So what you need at the beginning of a trial is people who you believe are all at risk for something to happen. Um, if you have a lot of people in a trial who simply are not at risk because they don't have the condition or they have a really super mild um, variant um, of the condition, it's simply not going to add power to be able to make observations quickly and arrive at conclusions quickly. So, you know, while I would say absolutely that we care about people with uh, variants that are uncertain or mosaic variants, um, they would not be 
um, ideal participants in a trial in order to try to get it at answers quickly. Do you think that you would selectively, I mean, <clears throat> as you said, what you want are people who have, who are at greatest risk for having something happen quickly. I mean, that would be the, the ideal uh, population that you would want. And would you stratify the uh, involvement that way? So there has been um, discussion about um, potentially selecting for people that have more, more severe classes of mutations that mm -hmm. are at higher risk for showing something to happen. Uh, I, I, uh, I would say the honest answer is that we haven't reached um, conclusions on that topic. Thank you so much. And um, I'm gonna take maybe two more questions and then we'll end for tonight. I have a couple updates um, at the very end of this. There are a couple questions back at the Enzostorin trial about the, side, the known side effects of Enzostorin. I think that um, it was discussed that the safety of Enzostorin has been studied for other uses. If you could speak to that for a brief moment. Open or Nate, yeah, yeah, I'll hop in now. Um, thanks. One, one of the things that was critically important to us is that we wanted to find um, a molecule that implicates the PKC ERK pathway that Hal spoke about. That is incredibly safe. Um, that's of utmost and critical importance for this patient population. So Enzostorin is a molecule um, that has been in over 60 preclinical and clinical programs in over 3,300 patients um, to in include a phase three trial um, for a condition called DLBCL or diffuse large B cell lymphoma where 493 patients were given Enzostorin, the same dose that we anticipate for VEDS uh, once daily for over three years. And the safety profile um, is really compelling. Um, you know, there's uh, only a couple of um, side effects that are different than the placebo arm of that trial. And it's things like nausea and diarrhea and chromaturia, which is um, discoloration of urine. There is one signal around QT prolongation that was mitigated in both uh, protocol as part of the trial, but also once medication was stopped. So um, this is this is a this is a molecule that we have great confidence in uh, that is uh, very safe. Uh, and now the definitive trial will test whether it's effective. Um, so that's that's the plan. I think one one of the things to remember about this is that um, it's been used in cancer treatment. And so the level of the drug that has to be used to get an effect there has to be high and it has to be you know, high enough to infiltrate the, the, um, the target organ. The target organ here is, is generalized. And I think that there would be some question about whether you need to even approach the levels of drug that you use in cancer treatments. Those are the levels for which you have information about complications and things of that sort. Um, but even the, you know, the timing of it, you know, what do you know about uh, the extent to which these signals um, can be altered by the drug uh, at lower levels and uh, things like that. So I, I think that there's a lot to, to look at. And I think that the, um, the complication profile from Enzostorin that you get from people who have relatively high doses of it may not reflect the kinds of things that you'd be looking at in this kind of trial. Thank you. And I'm going to ask one final question. It's kind of a, a two, maybe it's two questions to size as one question. Um, are there any, were there any research, was there any research discussed for doxycycline or CRISPR during the DeFi vet scientific meeting? Or is there any going on? Is that going to be applicable? What's going neither, on? Of those top, neither of those topics, I believe, came up in the meeting. That's not to say that there isn't research or commentary from those in the field. But. Yeah, I mean, um, many folks have heard about the amazing power of CRISPR, um, which is a method to change the DNA to, if you will, correct the DNA if it has a mistake. Um, that is uh, remarkably effective if you take cells out of the body and correct them. Um, there are some early applications um, inside the body, but um, they are very early. And um, none have really tackled the hurdles of trying to correct 
many different types of selves throughout the body, for example, in the, in the entire arterial tree. Um, so, uh, you know, I would say that there's lots of, um, uh, of hope, um, there's lots of hype, um, but there has to be a lot more substance before CRISPR would be ready for prime time um, in someone with vascular EDS. Thank you. And for doxycycline, is there any ongoing research into doxycycline? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm going to stop our Q&A at that point. There's been a lot of great questions. Uh, before you leave tonight, I do want to make sure that you're aware of a couple of things, including where you can find um, more information about the Defy Vets scientific meeting. So thank you again, everybody. Uh, the full agenda and the recording for the Defy Vets scientific meeting that was on April 9th, I believe it was, is at thevetsmovement.org slash Defy Vets meeting. Can you put that in the chat box so people can click on it? Absolutely. Um, do you want to grab that? Okay. Or anybody could. Um, oh, I can't. Um, here, I can type it out. I can't grab okay, it. Okay, when I click on the screen, it, it makes it move forward. So. Oh, okay. I'll take it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so please check that out. Be aware the re the day was about seven hours long. There are seven hours worth of recording to watch there, and, and maybe take it in pieces. It was a lot of great research, but also um, very very scientific and wonderful. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, upcoming events, Red Springs Day is of course May 21st, that is brought to you by Annabelle's Challenge, be sure to wear red, take a photo and share the hashtag Reds for Beds on May 21st. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Can, you, can, can you go back to the, the, the address? I wasn't done typing it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the vetsmovement.org slash defy vets meeting. There you go. And I see that Dr. Hal Dietz's dog has joined us for the remainder of the <laughs> webinar. Uh, <laughs> be cute. My brand new golden retriever puppy. Uh, that's a beauty. <laughs> so um, be sure to participate in Reds for Reds Day on May 21st, as we do every year. And then virtual annual conference, our annual conference will be virtual this year. So save the date, July 8th to the 11th this year, 2021. Uh, more information will be coming soon on that. Thank you so much, everybody, again, for your participation. If your question was not answered tonight or you have other questions that come up, you can always reach our Help and Resource Center. We have a registered nurse, Jan Lynch, and our Help and Resource Center, who is truly wonderful. And the best way and the fastest way to get your questions answered would be to go to thebedsmovement.org slash ask and submit your question using the form there. Uh, and we will get to as many as we can as soon as we can. I know there are a lot that are probably going to be submitted to Jan right after this webinar, which we definitely appreciate. Be patient, she will get to your questions as soon as she can. Thank you everybody. And thank you to all of our presenters tonight for your ongoing dedication to VEDS and for your time tonight. It's, I'm really truly incredibly grateful for you all and to the entire community. So thank you so much. Yes, thanks to all. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Good night.